we will now resume the reproductive justice hearing. We are starting on the second uh, panel. The second panel is entitled Religion, Conscious Objections, and Hospital Mergers. Uh, this event uh, is being chaired in this session by Judge Lynn Riddle. She's joined by Dr. Patricia Jones Blessman and by Professor Aziza Imad. Uh, this session begins with Louise Melling, the Deputy Legal Director and Director of the Center for Liberty at the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, I urge you to please look at our website, reproductivejusticeinitiative.com, where you are able to watch not only this tape, but other taped proceedings from the reproductive justice hearing and also learn more about the work of the Reproductive Justice Initiative and the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. Thank you so much and huge thank you to Michelle Goodwin. When Congress didn't want to hear from us, Michelle made sure that somebody would hear us. So hats off to you. Um, we've been, we heard in the morning panel already different ways in which politicians and our laws send a message to women that we are undeserving, we're stupid, and I'm going to talk now a little bit about why we're immoral as one of the messages that comes out from the laws, and in particular from the laws that are often referred to as conscience clause laws. When I think about conscience clause, I, what's often called claims of conscience, I would prefer to call them religious exemptions, or what I really would like to call them is religious refusals. What these are about are instances in which institutions and individuals are asserting a right to refuse to comply with the law in the name of religion. The instances in which I care as a representative of the ACLU and somebody who cares both about religion and about equality are, are those occasions where religion is invoked in ways that will then impose religion on others, harm others, or discriminate, as opposed to other occasions where we would readily, including the ACLU, steadfastly defend the right of somebody for accommodations where there will be no harm. We hear all across the country, well, uh, let me just step one back. As we talk about this, I just want to flag three different things, three different ways to think about it. When we talk about, when you hear people talk about conscience clause and exemptions, ask yourself, are they talking about an institution or are they talking about a person? If they're talking about an institution, does that institution serve people of diverse faith, hire people of diverse faith? Because if so, that means that institution, if it is to grant it an exemption, has mu is much more likely, or sort of almost inherently, than to be imposing its views on others if it is granted an exemption. Think Hobby Lobby, just for example. Um, if it's an, an individual, is that individual an officer of the government? If that person is granted an exemption from a law, you're putting the imprimatur of the government on that exemption. What's the exemption? What does it mean to do that? If it's an individual who's not with the government, what does it mean to accommodate? What are the costs in different ways to, the, to others of accommodation? We hear a lot of talk, as we should, about Kim Davis, for example, asserting a right not to provide marriage licenses because she objects to same-sex marriage. We hear about bakeries, inns, floral shops refusing to provide services to same-sex couples because, based on religion, they object to same-sex marriages. We hear about institutions firing lesbian and gay people in particular once those people marry, marry someone of the same sex because of religious objections. We hear far, far less about what's happening all across the country, which are occasions of hospitals turning away women seeking reproductive health care because the hospital doesn't like what they're doing. We hear far less conversation about pharmacies turning away women because they're there seeking reproductive health care. I'm here to argue that we should be hearing every bit as much about those occasions and to talk about why we're not and what the harm is of not hearing about those. In those cases, no less in my view than in the occasions of Kim Davis, the pharmacy, the religiously affiliated employer, what's happening is women are being turned away and given the message, we don't serve your kind here. Here's a few examples in which this is happening, in which we've, we've been able to sort of begin to highlight, I think, more robustly, and these are just a few, and everybody in the room, I think, is working on this, highlight the harms of religious exemptions in the healthcare context for women. 
Tamisha Means went to a hospital, her local hospital, when she was 18 weeks pregnant. She went because her water burst. She knew what that meant. She had other kids. She goes to her hospital, is now Catholic. She gets sent home. She comes back in pain. She gets sent home. She comes back a third time. On none of these occasions, the prior occasions, is she told at 18 weeks, having had her water burst in her case, she was not going to have the baby she wanted. On neither of those occasions was she told that given that her water had burst and where she wasn't going to have the baby, that the safest course of action for her would be to end the pregnancy and to do so quickly so as to avoid a risk of, of infection. On the third time, the hospital tried to send her home again, but she started to deliver. They admitted her, and she ultimately delivered a baby that died a few hours after birth. She wasn't given that information. She wasn't given that proper care because she was in a hospital governed by the um, religious and ethical directives for Catholic health care. We recently also filed a, a complaint on behalf of a woman, Jessica Mann, who has a brain tumor, was pregnant at the time we filed, was advised by her doctors that at the time of delivery, she should have her tubes tied. It wouldn't be safe for her to have another child, and she should consolidate, as all women should if they can want to have their tubes tied, consolidate the birth, the procedures for, for birth and sterilization. Her doctor worked at a, at a hospital that was Catholic. Her doctor was denied authorization to go forward with that. They, they put in a special plea explaining why this was medically necessary and given and rebuffed. Any one of us could face this. Catholic hospitals are one in 10 hospitals in America, sort of roughly, roughly stated. It's not just about Catholic hospitals, though. Today, the Supreme Court is assessing petitions for cert to assess whether or not the religious accommodation governing health care insurance, that, that controversial rule that women should have access to contraceptive coverage in their insurance is, is impermissible. Hobby Lobby said the requirement that you have to provide may violate your religious liberty, and they said so in part because of this thing we will kind of technical people call the accommodation, the thing that said, oh, if you don't like that rule, maybe you could state your objection to your insurer or ultimately to the government, and then your insurer will pick up the coverage meant to try to be a win-win, kind of. You get to sort of take a step away, and women still get coverage. Objections over, I think, 35, 40 cases around the country arguing that's a violation of religious liberty. Uh, Supreme Court will be taking one of those cases, conferencing today. As I said, we, those are occasions of harm in myriad ways. Those are occasions of harm in particular to those of us who are least advantaged and who can't readily go somewhere else, buy our way out, find another option. But we hear far, far, far less about those, as I said, than about the Kim Davis story. So I'm just going to sort of say why and then sort of say why I think that matters. I think we don't hear about it because the, our country is papered, papered completely since 1973 it began, with laws providing exemptions for institutions and for individuals who want to refuse to provide reproductive health care. It started within six months of Roe, and it is, it's over 40 states, for example, have laws that permit institutions, read hospitals to refuse to provide abortions, as well as individuals. That's just one, abortion is one piece. In many places, the laws are broader. But what we have in that respect is a culture that says that's OK, a culture that many of us have really sort of achieved adulthood in, where that's the backdrop. What does that, that backdrop has implications for our health. And that backdrop has implications for our equality in that if we can't exercise these rights, we have far less chance to exercise other rights. But at a more profound level, what I want to say is that backdrop sends a powerful message that abortion and increasingly contraception as well as sterilization are immoral. And not only are they immoral, but those of us who seek those services are immoral. How else do we understand a regime that says hospitals can refuse to provide abortion services? Constitutionally protected? one in three women, but you can refuse. 
How else do we understand rules that say that pharmacies can turn us away because what we seek is contraception? How else do we understand rules that all over the place say that because we want to exercise this way of being a woman, this way of controlling our lives, this way of making decisions, we can have a sign put up in the door of the hospital, in the door of the pharmacy, in the door of Hobby Lobby or whatever saying, we don't serve your kind here. It's time for change. It's time to fight back. You all can do it. Mr. Lipper, good morning. Good morning, thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Lipper. I am Senior Litigation Counsel at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Um, as you can imagine, these days, uh, for a church-state organization, business is booming, and um, <laughs> among our cases, uh, we represent an intervener, a student at the University of Notre Dame, um, who has intervened in Notre Dame's challenge to the contraception accommodation, um, seeking to preserve her and students' access uh, to contraceptive coverage. Um, I want to pick up uh, where Louise left off, talking about Hobby Lobby and the contraceptive cases, which have significant impacts not only for access to contraception, but which are also providing uh, the legal framework for other people and other institutions that are seeking exemptions across a range of areas. Um, I think when, when the Obama administration announced that employers would be required to include contraceptive coverage in their policies, I think very few of us foresaw that it would be a multi-billion dollar chain of retail craft stores that would be the one to persuade the Supreme Court to undermine the government's plan. Um, you know, as background I think is worth repeating, the Affordable Care Act's regulations did not require employers to use birth control or even to buy birth control. All they had to do was include contraceptives in the hundreds of other uh, medical treatments covered by their insurance plans. And whether to buy or use birth control was and is an employee's own decision using her own compensation uh, in consultation with her own physician and guided by her own beliefs. Uh, last year, however, in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby stores, the Supreme Court ruled that the federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act required the government to exempt objecting for-profit corporations from including contraceptives in their employee health plans. And ongoing litigation, which as Louise mentioned, will find its way back to the Supreme Court as early as this afternoon, um, could imperil even more modest efforts by the government to protect women's health. So, where we started here was with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA for short, um, which requires exemptions or accommodations when a federal law imposes a, quote, substantial burden on religious exercise, unless application of that federal law is the least restrictive means of fulfilling a compelling governmental interest. And in Hobby Lobby, the Supreme Court ruled that RIFRA prohibited the government from re requiring objecting for-profit corporations to cover contraceptives. Although the Supreme Court purported to take into account the interests of affected women, the actual decision left Hobby Lobby's employees in the lurch without the full contraceptive coverage to which they were entitled by law. Um, and one of the most remarkable and what may be one of the most far-reaching aspects of the Hobby Lobby decision was the way that the Supreme Court defined a substantial burden on religious exercise. So the first thing I want to note briefly is that religious exemptions are available only when the objector is sincere in its beliefs. Yet in Hobby Lobby, the Supreme Court overlooked some red flags that cast doubt on the sincerity of the plaintiff's objections. Many of the for-profit plaintiffs, including Hobby Lobby itself, had actually previously covered the very drugs and devices that they all of a sudden claimed to oppose. And in each case, the explanation was the same. Um, after the Obama administration announced the regulations, the company said it reviewed its health care plan and it was shocked to discover that it was um, covering contraceptives or certain forms of contraceptives. Uh, but despite this somewhat irregular history, the government conceded that the for-profit plaintiffs were raising sincere religious objections, and so the Supreme Court did not explore that issue further. Um, but second, even if the plaintiff's religious objections were sincere, they fell not on the individual owners, that is, you know, the people that might have actual views about contraception, but rather on their for-profit corporations. The Hobby Lobby decision marked the first time that a for-profit corporation had won a free exercise case. 
And although the plaintiffs in these cases were closely held corporations, closely held does not mean small. Uh, more than half of American workers are employed by closely held corporations. Um, Hobby Lobby, by way of example, uh, has revenues exceeding $3 billion, and it has over 20,000 employees. Third, and perhaps most importantly, contraceptives are used only after the independent decision of a company's employees, often after they consult with their physicians, and which means that the substantial burden that the plaintiffs claimed and that the Supreme Court recognized in this case arose from employers' inability to control the manner in which their employees made their own medical decisions using their own health benefits, which they received as part of their own compensation. Um, what the Supreme Court said was that as long as the plaintiffs were asserting what was purported to be a sincere religious objection, the court would not offer any independent legal analysis as to whether the asserted burden was a substantial burden. Um, and that means that plaintiffs, including large commercial entities, can now claim a formal legal interest in controlling other people's decisions and behaviors, no matter how personal or how private. Uh, there was one final anomaly in many of the claims, and it um, I think is also going to have broad implications, which is that several of the plaintiffs, including Hobby Lobby, claimed to object not to covering contraception uh, writ large, but only certain contraceptives, and in most cases it was emergency contraception and the IUD. And the plaintiffs claimed that these particular forms of contraception were quote unquote abortive fashions um, because they said these forms of contraception prevent the implantation of fertilized eggs. Um, but even if you believe that the uh, preventing the implantation of a fertilized egg, even at its you know, very beginning, constitutes an abortion, virtually all modern science suggests that emergency contraception and the IUD prevent fertilization, not implantation. And although it's true that courts aren't and shouldn't be in the business of second-guessing a plaintiff's theology, um, there's a big difference between deferring to a religious view, so for instance, my religion prohibits me from eating pork, and accepting a mistake of fact. For instance, if I insisted that spinach comes from a pig. And, um, <laughs> and, and so notwithstanding the plaintiff's claims about abortive fashions, or as many of them claim, quote, abortion pills, the Hobby Lobby decision applied to contraception, not abortion. Um, and in any event, many of the plaintiffs in these cases sought exemptions for covering any and all contraceptives, so not just IUDs and emergency contraception, um, but even the birth control pill. Now, none of this would have mattered if the Supreme Court had recognized the need for these regulations um, in order to ensure that women have access to contraceptives, because under RIFRA, the government may impose even substantial burdens on religious exercise if necessary to fulfill a compelling governmental interest. And, and in addition, now there were previous Supreme Court decisions that made clear that while religious accommodations, as Louise, as Louise mentioned, are sometimes permissible and appropriate, they violate the First Amendment's Establishment Clause if they impose burdens on third parties. The Supreme Court dealt with this issue through a sleight of hand. The court said there would be no harm to affected women because first, the Obama administration had created what Louise mentioned, the accommodation for religious nonprofit organizations, um, and second, that the accommodation could be extended to Hobby Lobby and other for-profit corporations as well. And just to review, so under this accommodation, a nonprofit organization with a religious exemption um, is exempt from covering contraceptives as long as they inform their insurance company or plan administrator or the government of their religious objection. Um, at that point, the government arranges for the insurer or plan administrator to provide the coverage itself without involving the employer and without charging either the employer or employees. Um, but after pointing to the nonprofit accommodation as a less restrictive alternative to ensuring that women received contraceptive coverage, the majority in Hobby Lobby then declined to say whether that accommodation itself complied with RIFRA. And uh, as we've seen, that is more than an academic question because there are over two dozen lawsuits challenging the accommodation as well. Um, these plaintiffs you know, include not only small social service providers, but large national research universities like Notre Dame. And they argue that even requesting an exemption in writing substantially burdens their religious exercise um, because after they object, the government will make other arrangements for, their effect, for the affected women 
uh, to receive coverage. Um, imagine if a judge who opposes the death penalty <clears throat> not only refused to hear capital cases, but also refused to recuse herself because once she did so, the case would be reassigned to another judge who might impose the death penalty because that's what the plaintiffs are doing in challenging the accommodation. It's no longer about genuine burdens on religious exercise. Um, it's about denying their employees access to birth control, whatever its source. Um, as we'll find out this afternoon, one or more of these challenges will soon reach the Supreme Court. Although most federal appeals courts have rejected these claims, and not all of them have, and so over a year after the Hobby Lobby decision, employees' access to contraceptive coverage continues to hang by a thread. Thank you. Ms. Kisling, good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make two claims Can in you the court. Give us your name. I want to tell me who I am. Okay. I'm Frances Kisling. I'm the president of the Center for Health, Ethics, and Social Policy. I'm better known in the reproductive health movement as the person who was the president of Catholics for Free Choice for 25 years. Um, so that's, that's who I am. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit different than everybody else. You know, I'm a Catholic. I'm expected to do that. Um, and I'm going to make essentially two claims about the way in which religion is playing itself out in the policy arena, both within the courts and within the Obama administration. Um, the first claim I'm going to make, I'm making these claims in the beginning because who knows how much I'll get to. Um, the first claim I'm really going to make is that the Obama administration um, has interfered with the internal workings of a very dynamic and changing Catholic Church. I'm going to talk about Catholics because that's what I know about. Um, and, and that, in fact, it has taken sides in a variety of theological and practical disputes that are going on at the highest levels of the Catholic Church and between, between cardinals and between Catholic people and their church. And that you know, whether it's constitutionally permitted to do this or not, I'm not a lawyer, but um, in effect, it's really making it very difficult for me to participate in my church when my government has taken a position that undermines my positions. Okay, very selfish here. Um, the second thing, the claim that I'm going to make is that if we are to grant, um, and um, Mr. Lipper made some references to this in the, in the sense that the courts have seemed to say, well, you know, it's really not our business to analyze whether a theological position of the church is correct or incorrect, and we just take them at their word. If they say their religion requires this, um, we'll give them an exemption. And my sense is that this is not possible that if we are going to grant religious exemptions, um, we need to hold religious institutions or individuals to the same standard of scrutiny that anyone else who presents themselves before the court is required to respond to, i.e. facts. There are in religion and in theology facts. Catholic Church has positions it has theology, it has dogma, it has doctrine, it has law. We have a whole big law book called Canon Law, and it has a whole variety of directives. And if the church, as an institution, wishes to present itself before the courts and say, we require an exemption because our religion requires us not to provide end-of-life care, not to employ people who do not agree with our religious positions, um, uh, and, of course, not to uh, provide access to or services such as contraception, abortion, sterilization, in vitro fertilization, a whole range of services. So we got to be exempted from having to do that. I think the government has an obligation, if it's going to grant such exemptions, to look seriously and examine those claims. So we will need a new department um, in the Obama administration in the, in, in, the, in the White House, in Health and Human Services, instead of a faith-based group within the government that's trying to figure out how to give money to religious organizations, which is what we have now, we need a faith-based 
entity, not so much faith-based, we need an um, objective entity that examines the positions and sees whether they actually need an exemption or don't need an exemption. And I would say right now my conclusion is that we're probably, since I think that's a requirement that the theology needs to be looked at, the evidence needs to be presented, do we really want a theology czar in the White House? Does President Obama need, a, in addition to a Department of Health and Human Services, a Department of Religious Scrutiny? Um, if he doesn't, and, or if we think that's probably not a good idea to deal with the First Amendment, then we are probably better off not giving religious exemptions at all. Now, I also have trouble with that position, but I think there's a certain logic to people requesting, people and in institutions requesting something from government that is an exemption from normal practice in which they should be required to prove that they need it. So that's, that's, my, that's my basic point. Now, a couple of other points that I'd like to make around that. Religion has changed since the time the Constitution was established. We have constitutional problems around change. You know, we see this, I have problems around the Bible as an um, unchanging doc, you know, piece of literature or a piece of theology. Um, but the same thing is true about a constitution. A constitution was written at a certain point in time. It has to be applied to current situations. Religions, 200 years ago, when the US was, was established, were slightly less rambunctious institutions than they are now. The understanding of religion was that it was an unchanging institution. Each religion had its rules. Everybody followed the rules of religion. If you didn't, maybe you got dunked, um, you know, if you lived in Massachusetts. And maybe you got hung if you lived somewhere else, you know. So that was how, so it was very simple to say, you know, religious freedom, no establishment, etc. Religion isn't like that anymore. It's very hard to figure out. Even in an institution with a single leader, i.e. a pope like the Catholic Church, what actually is permitted and not permitted? Anybody who followed, for example, the recent synod on the family over the last year in Rome saw cardinals from Germany arguing with cardinals from Botswana about whether Catholics who had gotten divorced and remarried should be allowed to receive communion. Some of them said, this is an unchanging, absolute thing about the, the indissolubility of marriage, and we can't let these people receive communion. Um, and then you had others, like the Germans, who were saying, well, you know, uh, is it really, is allowing them to receive communion really a violation of this, that, or the other thing? So that's going on. Now, I want to make some specific examples about some of the disputes within the Catholic Church on the area, in the area of contraception and abortion and sterilization, and some of the rules. And I hope I get enough minutes to do this. So I'm just going to do a couple. Let's talk about sterilization. Okay, that's another issue that's coming up a lot. Catholic hospitals are claiming that, and Catholic bishops are telling Catholic hospitals, you can't do sterilization. Again, you know, mutilation of the body is one of the claims. It's another form of contraception. Two minutes. Okay, so I'll just do sterilization. So the Sisters of Mercy decided 30 years ago that they were going to do sterilizations postpartum in their hospitals best medical practice. If a woman is having a baby and she wants to be sterilized, better to do it while she has the baby than make her do it again. They sent out a notice to their hospitals that the hospitals could, if they chose, do this. They didn't have to, but they could. The Vatican got wind of it. Vatican wrote them a letter and said, you rescind that rule right now or we are taking your company, Sisters of Mercy, and we're putting you in receivership, and we're gonna own everything. We're gonna own your schools, we're gonna own your hospitals, we're gonna really make your life very difficult. Sisters of Mercy faced a decision 
do we follow the Pope or do we follow that? So there's one example. I'm going to do just another one about this contraceptive stuff, okay, <clears throat> and particularly around things like, is it required as a Catholic or a Catholic institution to distance yourself so much from contraception that you won't even write a letter to the government and say, we don't want to do it. We can't do it. Well, we have rules. We have canon law. Canon law, as secular law, distinguishes between what they call remote and material cooperation in evil to do an abortion, to provide, to give her contraceptives. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end. That is against the rules. That's a material, hands-on cooperation. To write a letter is remote cooperation. And you can, under our laws, participate and engage in remote cooperation. End of story, um, because of limits of time, I would like to talk more about women. But um, end of story is that it's not simple. It's not straightforward what the Catholic rules are. It drives me crazy as a Catholic that everyone just accepts what the bishops tell them the rules are because the bishops are not always honest and the bishops are not theologians. Most of the bishops never went to theology school. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> no ending. Uh, thank you, Professor Goodwin, good morning. Good morning, thank you very much, Chairwoman uh, Riddle and your distinguished uh, panel. Uh, my name is Michelle Goodwin. I'm a Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine, uh, where I direct the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. One of our chief initiatives happens to be reproductive uh, justice. We have a reproductive justice uh, initiative. I want to speak to you about the misuse of science uh, within the contraceptive context because it intersects on questions of religion. One glaring myth, for example, uh, that uh, persuasively uh, substitutes science um, is, is found in recent uh, court cases, and that is this confusion, if you will, between contraception uh, and abortifacients, and this uh, became an issue in the Hobby Lobby case. Uh, in that case, its owners claimed religious op uh, opposition to abortion. Uh, however, the subject of their lawsuit was the Affordable Care Act, as, as we've heard today. Uh, the difference between an abortifacient and contraception is incredibly important. Contraceptives prevent pregnancy. Abortifacients terminate pregnancies. I apologize for those in the audience and those who've taken sexual education classes <laughs> who understand this. Uh, but it's important to explain because lawmakers and judges seem to confuse this sometimes. Uh, the drugs uh, and their uh, processes function distinctly and differently uh, by definition and how they function, uh, which I will describe uh, to you, uh, is that, um, for example, uh, a, a contraception uh, itself um, will not allow a term of pregnancy to occur uh, an abortifacient terminates uh, a pregnancy. You might think about this um, as a comparative with vaccination, for example. Vaccines function to prevent disease and illness. A vaccine, however, is not an antibiotic um, or a medication to be used after the illness has embedded in the body. Um, yet increasingly, pharmacists uh, refuse to dispense or prescribe birth control and emergency contraception, citing religious or moral objections based on a confused logic, such as what um, I've described. And this is important for law because in reading hundreds of political statements and articles quoting politicians, it is clear that many lawmakers responsible for crafting legislation that impacts women's lives lack the basic awareness and understanding of women's health and reproductive ovulation, fertilization, and pregnancy. Uh, for too many, these happen to be blurred lines. Uh, over the span of um, recent decades, um, there have been millions, in fact, 
there have been dozens of millions of unintended pregnancies. In fact, over the span of just the last decade alone, it's estimated that there have been 30 million unintended uh, pregnancies. Emergency contraceptives can play a significant role by considerably reducing the number of unplanned pregnancies if women have access. Thus, how politicians label these drugs can significantly impact women's lives. The scientific community and federal law have long defined pregnancy by the status of a fertilized egg implanting in the wall of a woman's uterus. That is, pregnancy begins when a fertilized egg is implanted in the uterus. Conception is an essential step towards pregnancy, but a fertilized egg is not a pregnancy. Rather, conception is a fertilized egg in need of a home in the uterine wall. Without that, a woman's body will terminate it during her monthly menstrual cycle. The basic laws of biology dictate that not only will a pregnancy not develop from a hovering fertilized egg, it cannot develop without implantation. And again, I apologize for all of you who understand this. But how a pregnancy is defined becomes critical to distinguishing between a contraceptive that prevents pregnancy and an abortive patient that terminates it. Nevertheless, State definitions of pregnancy vary, and the sharp divide as to what a pregnancy is impacts law and ultimately women's health care and medical access. As noted by the Guttmacher Institute, which has done incredible work in this domain, in a 2005 report, they note that some states define a pregnancy at the point of conception which is scientifically imprecise and incredibly misleading. These facts matter for law because policies, legislation, and judicial opinions derive from these understandings. In 2009, the U.S. District Court Judge Edward Corman ruled that the FDA ignored science while allowing politics to dictate its decisions in 2006 to limit access to over-the-counter emergency contraception to women over the age of 18. In a scathing opinion, he wrote, quote, the FDA repeatedly and unreasonably delayed issuing a decision on Plan B for suspect reasons. And I quote from the opinion when he said, putting aside for the moment the specifics of the many claims brought by the plaintiffs and the details of each of the FDA's decisions, the gravamen of plaintiffs' claim is that the FDA's decisions regarding Plan B on the citizen's position uh, petition, excuse me, were arbitrary and capricious because they were not the result of reasoned and good faith agency decision making. And the judge concluded that the plaintiffs were right, that the efforts by the FDA had been arbitrary and had been capricious, had in fact ignored science and had been driven by politics. And if politicians confuse contraceptives with abortive patients, this very likely will have significant impacts on legislation, which in turn affects access to preventative pregnancy medicines that have nothing to do with aborting a fetus or even impairing fertilized ova, as was demonstrated in prior uh, administrations. Neglecting or overruling science in favor of a religious agenda that misreads biology could have devastating, chilling impacts, chilling, chilling impacts on the choices that women and girls make, including women who consider themselves to be pro-life and oppose abortion. And that's because women who oppose abortion but who do not wish to be pregnant might sidestep using very relevant medical options based on misleading and inaccurate information that's provided by lawmakers. And I want to give some example as to what is being seen on the ground 
in terms of uh, the dispensing of uh, incredibly important medications to people. For example, um, Lori, Lori Boyer um, experienced a horrific rape um, that occurred at the hands of someone that she knew. When she sought uh, medical treatment from uh, her doctor, um, the doctor shook his head uh, saying that it's against his religion to provide her plan B. Kmart, Amanda Renz, her uh, pharmacist, or the pharmacist who was working that even evening at Kmart, refused to issue her simple birth control pills because that was against his religion. This has even impacted married couples who have sought to receive Plan B uh, contraceptives. And I could share during um, your question and answer period uh, with the panel other examples of individuals married, unmarried, victims of rape, and others who have been denied essential, constitutionally protected medications that would help them. And it's most shocking and most chilling when those who've been denied medical care and services have particularly been the victims of rape. Thank you so much for these uh, powerful presentations. Um, I, have a, I have a group of questions that are specific and general, so I'll just put them on the table and, and perhaps you can pick them up um, as you'd like. Um, the questions uh, for me coming from uh, Ms. Melling and Mr. Lipper's uh, presentations is a big one. So what is the role of religion in healthcare? You know, are there any accommodations that are legitimate? Um, and, 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 you know, there, I, I was wondering if it was a closely held nonprofit, for example, or a, if we can describe it that way, or small nonprofit, how do we feel? Do we feel differently about this? Um, and um, Ms. Kissling, this is a question for you as well. What is the role for religion in health? Um, and I, I, I did wonder, as you were speaking, um, on one hand, the government is interfering with the negotiations and conversations happening within the Catholic Church, and I'd love to hear more about that, especially on the issue of women, as you said. Um, but it, it did strike me that perhaps the Catholic Church is going to the courts to gain legitimacy as well, and I wonder if you think that inverse is also true. Um, and then Professor Goodwin, um, I was struck by your presentation, of course, and um, I, I guess the basic question for me is how do we educate lawmakers or educate the general population in a better way? I mean, to use a different example from a different setting, you know, we're in a moment where the Texas <coughs> school books say that slavery was the, you know, importing, bringing in slave, slaves was bringing in workers, basically. We have a, a real problem here, um, generally speaking. Um, and if uh, elected officials are beholden to conservative voters, will any sort of basic science education make a difference? Um, and of course, I'd love to hear your other examples about um, denial of medication. If I may, I'll ask uh, Mr. Lippert to start uh, with the responses. You have your question? Sure. So, Thank you. So I think there are, there are ways, I think, to provide in certain circumstances accommodations that um, do respect sincere religious beliefs. Um, you know, I think it's easier, again, with individuals than with institutions, but also don't create a situation, A, where the person needing care is deprived of it, but also where you don't have the message of, I'm sorry, I can't serve you, you know, I can't serve you or I can't provide this, you know, come back later. And so, for instance, if there is a, um, a particular doctor with, you know, particular sets of objections, um, having that doctor do another role in the hospital, you know, there's obviously a lot of different jobs, you know, it's sort, sort of, um, uh, the analogy in, in the marriage clerk situation is, look, if you want to do paperwork and have someone else work the desk, um, that, that you know, can be viable. Same thing with a pharmacy, you know, not all pharmacists necessarily have to be the one handing out the, um, the pills. So I think there are ways to provide modest accommodations. Um, you know, we've seen the nonprofit accommodation that is still being challenged. Um, there are ways to provide modest accommodations in a way that still enables seamless access to care. Um, but also respects religious beliefs. So I think there, there is room on the margins. I think it can be done. I think the, 
the flip side is one of the perverse um, effects of both Hobby Lobby and the ongoing challenges is that it's sending a message that if you do, if the government does try to create reasonable accommodations, um, the existence of those accommodations will be used to further undermine the rule and even the accommodations are going to be challenged. And like, you know, one could not um, help but think that you know, if the Obama administration could go back in time to 2012, they would be like, you know, forget it. We're not going to offer this nonprofit accommodation. It's going to make us impossible for us to enforce the law against for-profit corporations and even the nonprofit thing is going to be objected. So I think there are ways to do it provided that the courts then don't use those to hold against you. But I think ultimately is you can, I think, accommodate individuals sort of on a, on a broader level, broader tweaks to responsibility so that they're accommodated, but so that the patient is never the wiser. And I think that's really the only way to do it. Hey, Ms. Melling, would you like to go next? Uh, I'll just add very quickly, which is, you know, just the basic rule. If you are an institution, I don't really, I don't care whether you're serving 10 people or you're serving a million people. If you're an institution, a healthcare institution that opens your doors to the public and you're serving people of diverse faiths, then I don't see how you can then, as, as a, impose your religious views to govern healthcare. That's very different from a doctor whose patient, you know, the patient has a particular faith and wants the doctor to work with his, her faith, for example, in terms of how, what kind of care she gets. I think in the healthcare context too, it's incredibly important to recognize, when I go to my doctor, I'm hoping my, my doctor knows more than I do. Right? I'm relying on that person for particular information. I don't have the same kind of, I'm not saying that we're passive or stupid when we go to the doctor, but we are relying on them to do something particular. So to not provide in particular information and referrals, let alone care in that context, strikes me as ev even more troubling than in, in some other context. I mean, to me she means wasn't told, right? She wasn't told based on a view, so that makes it much harder for her even assuming she had the resources to go seek an alternative. On the, on the question of individuals, I, ag I agree with Greg, but I'm going to say something outside of my ACLU hat. My ACLU hat, we steadfastly stand for the proposition of accommodating individuals, where you can do so under the terms that Greg has mentioned, which is it's you get the care and you don't know that somebody objected to providing you the care. So there's no shame and there's seamless service. What I say to myself though a lot is, I just think about what message do you send back? So there's a case for example out of some, I think it's England, and it's about a clerk who doesn't want to register same-sex marriages. And in, she gets fired and she brings a suit and she said, but there were other clerks who would do this. They could have just stepped up. And the court says, but there were lesbian and gay people who worked in that office. And so what message are you sending? Now that's, we can talk about all the differences. That's the government. But what message are you sending behind the scenes in some sense? So what, how do you, I think we at least have to ask ourselves what, the question, what message you're sending. And I think about the cases, look, there were, there were all sorts of objections to racial integration predicated on faith. The cases Bob Jones goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court about interracial dating, right? Hospitals became integrated in, in part because of Medicare rules. If you object based on faith to integration, and there's a crazy case out of the Ninth Circuit recently too, we never would have said, oh, we'll accommodate that doctor who only wants to treat white patients as a matter of faith. I'm not saying that's the same, but at least raises questions for me. And again, I am so talking now as Melling, not <laughs> as um, organization. But, but just, and I don't have a position, but, but I just think we have to, those are questions to ask, and we're asking them in other contexts. And, and I, I'll shut up in just one second. I say that understanding that people have serious issues of faith. There are things I haven't wanted to do in my career because of my principles, mm -hmm. right, in, in different jobs, and I really hoped somebody would hear me and accommodate. And those weren't even based on a, on a religious view that, that where I might suffer in a, in a deeper kind of way. Or, um, 
And so I take it seriously, and I think we, we really do have to respect that, too, since we are in a diverse society. I want to get, get in on this before the time runs out. Um, I think that the length of the answers indicates the difficulty <laughs> that With even those of, uh, <laughs> well, the length of the length of both your answers <laughs> indicates the difficulty of coming to grips with this in some kind of really sensitive way. It's a so charitable evaluation. It's a very answers. charitable evaluation. <laughs> I admit it myself. Um, I, I'm going to try to answer this quickly. In terms of the government, of the question around my concern, you know, like you know, stop government making my life harder by siding with one side in a dispute, which you really don't know what the hell you're talking about anyway. That's my point. And I think here I go to Roe, and perhaps my interpretation of Roe is incorrect. But when I read the part of Roe that says neither science, religion, law, etc., has figured out when the fetus becomes a person. The next part of that, as I read it, and it's not a direct quote, is, and you are not going to use our court to settle something that is unsettled in every aspect of society. And this is what I would say I am asking for when, the, when religious bodies go to the, to the government and say, settle this issue, is to say, we're not competent. We're not competent to settle this issue, and we're not going to make a decision. That's it. But I do want to talk on this role of religion, conscience stuff, et cetera, just for, and I hope shorter. I may prove myself to be wrong. And that is, I think we are paying, as advocates, far too much attention. I know we have to pay attention to this, to religious objections to providing reproductive health services. This is important, and it should be dealt with. The problem in this country is that it's not just religion that is giving us a problem about providing reproductive health services. Our laws permit public exactly. hospitals. The law permits public hospitals in the United States of America not to provide abortion. It permits um, medical schools from training doctors to perform abortions. We have clinics closing right and left for services and we have institute, hospital type institutions not providing those services. We have doctors who perform abortions, I know, who will only perform abortions to 12 weeks. They're our friends. We don't challenge them. We don't say, oh, a doctor, how come? Or a Planned Parenthood, a Planned Parenthood clinic that stops at 12 weeks. I mean, we understand the problems. I in no way want to minimize the, 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 the pressure that everybody is under. But what we need to really be doing, we're advocates, we're lawyers, we're whatever we are. Our job is to make these services available. And the major problem in these services being available is not the Catholic hospitals of America. It is a major problem. It is not the major problem. And we are doing nothing about other institutions that do not provide. And frankly, it makes us look anti-religious, because the only ones we really care about are the religious people who won't do what we want them to do. We don't care about secular people who won't do what we want them to do or what we think is right. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Professor Goodwin, we have about five minutes left, and I think they're all yours. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Perhaps I'll share. The question that's been put to me is a very important question, uh, which is how in the world uh, do we educate our lawmakers and our judges? Uh, well, I would like to thank the chairwoman and also uh, the chancellors who are with her uh, for presiding over these proceedings uh, because I think moments like this matter and I think that moments uh, that can be captured like this on the Hill will matter. I think it's very telling that uh, these types of hearings have not been taking place. Uh, in Congress, and what it is that the nation gets to see is very much a, a um, hostile treatment towards the concerns of women, where it is about defunding programs uh, that support the health care of women, that it is not about tell us about what's happening when women are being turned away after rape from getting uh, the essential medical care that they deserve, 
There's not been hearings about uh, the mass incarceration of women and women experiencing breast cancer behind bars, ovarian cancer behind bars, being shackled during giving birth or having to give birth in hospital toilets. The conversations on the Hill have not been about domestic violence and how it intensifies during a woman's pregnancy or even the connection between gun violence and gun control and the lives of women and the use of that type of powerful weaponry against women during their pregnancy. The conversations on the Hill have not been about the school to prison pipeline that captures girls in such horrific and shocking ways that the data that we have researched and find, I have to look at it over and over again because it is almost unbelievable. None of that has been about women being kept in solitary confinement in this country for the protection of their fetuses nor a discussion about how lawyers are being paid for by states to protect and also advise fetuses when they're not being provided for the women who are carrying them. So we need to have those conversations. And today we're having it at the National Press Club, but it also needs to be at the White House. It needs to be in the halls of Congress. And I also want to add to that Sex education matters. We have completely distorted this. In some states, it's not even required. In some states where they require it, it is abstinence-only education. And so young people are being denied essential tools and information that could help them prepare and plan better in their own lives. That does a tremendous disservice not only to young people, but it does a disservice to us all. I just want to... I'm going to be very quick, but this is, I, I, think, this is, I think this is important. Please I, want to say right something, I want to say something about the Planned, Par Planned Parenthood and provision of contraceptive minutes, services. Um, at the time of the ACA debate, the head of the Catholic Health Association, Sister Carol Keehan, made a suggestion about how the Obama administration could handle this problem. She said, give the money to Planned Parenthood and let them provide contraception to every woman in this country. That was the Catholic Health Association. She didn't say defund Planned Parenthood. She said, take it off my back as Catholic hospitals, give the contraceptive money to Planned Parenthood, and let them provide contraception. I think it's time for Planned Parenthood to let people know what the Catholic Health Association thought. They didn't think you should be defunded. They thought you should get more money and do more contraception. I want to thank all of the members of this very fine panel, the panel on religion, uh, excuse me, conscience objections and hospital mergers, and thank you so much for your expertise and your brilliance. Thank you. <laughs>